All right, we're here with Colonel David Grossman. We're talking about, first of all, the issue of teachers and whether or not to arm teachers. A lot of discussion about that. I've been offering some training to teachers here in Iowa, and it seems like there are teachers who are sheepdogs. But what argument would you make to the administrators who are kind of right now putting the roadblock in front of them saying, no, there's no reason for a teacher to stand in defense of their students? You know, John, in uh, Red Lake High School, teacher Neva Rogers died blocking the, the door with her body. At, uh, at Sandy Hook Elementary School, the first two to die was two unarmed educators, a principal and another administrator charged the killer. Two unarmed women just charged the killer. And, uh, and, and teacher Victoria Soto died blocking the door with her body at Sandy Hook. You know, one principal told me, he said, I will die for my children. Right. Give me something beside my keys in my hand. Right. Yeah, they, they, will, they will die for our kids. Give them something beside the keys in their hand. And uh, uh, what, what people need to realize is that it's a done deal. Uh, we were just in Utah. I do a lot of work in Utah. I don't think there's a school left in Utah that had armed educators. It's been doing it for 20 years, 100% success. Uh, Ohio, 85% of the counties in Ohio have armed educators. Colorado, more and more. Texas been doing it for 20 years, more and more every year. Texas calls them their, their school marshals. Mm -hmm. They're like the sky marshal. Right, I, so, like, I like that concept. Yeah, somebody on that plane has a gun. You don't know right. when, you don't know where. Somebody in the school has a gun. They train them all summer long. They put them in the schools armed. And, and they've been doing it for 20 years with 100% success. So it, it's a done deal. Uh, across the South, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, we're, we're seeing enhanced carry where you, you got a concealed care permit, but you get extra training and extra qualification right. that you can carry in the schools. And they got armed educators across their schools. The, the idea that this is some weird, wacko idea, but it's just the opposite. And, and there's one or two people in every school with training could do a good job. Nobody's going to force anybody right, to carry exactly. a gun. Nobody's, nobody's going to you know, say you've got to do this. But for those who are led this way, I think we have to deeply respect every school's right to make their own decision. Right, that's that, good. That, that's what it's about, is respecting everybody's right to make their own decision. Now, what I found in this business is if we have people that have the right mindset, like you're talking, like the ones that will stand in front of the bad man and yeah. take the bullet, why not, if they're willing, train them? Because they've already have that sheepdog mentality yeah. that you talk about. Yeah. And you know, when uh, I'm, I'm a, I've been had the honor to train at, uh, at front site, gun site, military training, uh, a lot of other, uh, Hujitsu, the martial art of the firearm. But in, you know, in a good four or five day class at, 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 uh, at, at Pruntset, you'll be amazed how much you can learn. I retired from the Army after 24 years, and I thought I knew what to do with the pistol. Right. Uh, and when I went to, to gun site, the first two days were some of the hardest days of my life because I had to realize how much I didn't know. These kind of civilian classes, when you do these intense right. four day classes, people don't realize the level of training of the level of skill you come out of there with after just four or five days. Well, that's a nice segue because I've offered any teacher in Iowa, any church member, any sheepdog, in fact, I'll extend it out to all the sheepdog seminar folks, to pay for them to go through that four-day class, give them a free certificate. Because once you get through that, like you said, you don't know what you don't know until you take the training. And at that point, hopefully, and then it's going to be, okay, I understand now I need even more training past yes. that. yes. So what, what do we need as far as a baseline? Because if you go to a front side or gun side or one of those, you're going to get the, the shooting, you're going to get the lectures on moral and uh, legal decision making, uh, the color code of mental awareness. There's a whole lot more than just the gun thing. Yeah, and, and I think when we go to these reputable schools, and, and the two, you know, the, the Harvard and Yale of, of firearms training are uh, front side and gun side pretty much, most people will tell you. Uh, when you go to one of those reputable schools and you take a four-day course, uh, you've got a superb baseline that will carry you from that point on. But you're right. What happens is you get a hunger for more. You know, I, I tell people, don't be a gun snob. Don't say, well, you know, if you don't have, uh, you know, 30 days of range time and 5,000 rounds of ammo, you can't be trusted. You know, they, mm -hmm. you see a lot of that right. with the Brits. Yep. But, uh, you know, my, uh, my grandmother in the 1930s, uh, with a little 32 revolver, uh, shot a guy off the back balcony in New Orleans, uh, middle of the summer, somebody coming in the back, uh, second floor back balcony. The granny probably never fired more than 50 rounds in her life. It was the ultimate point and click interface. She pointed right. the revolver, <laughs> pulled <laughs> the trigger, the back guy went away. Right. Granny probably never fired more than 50 rounds in her life. So, you know, don't be this gun stuff. But once you start having that gun, then you, you, you realize that 
it, people, people's lives depend upon it, and I need to get better with this. And it'll cause you to, to seek more training, and, and that's a beautiful thing. All right. I think, you know, among law enforcement, we have a bunch of them at the seminar today. If you looked at law enforcement in general, they're not all gun guys. Yeah. yeah. There might be 20% that are the gun yeah. guys, and the rest are want to just be cops. Yeah. And you see that in these training scenarios where you have someone with zero training that passes the qualification at the yep. end, and you have some guy from a county sheriff that's like, oh, my goodness, I've never had to compete like this yeah. before. Yeah. But, but in the end, the goal is all, you know, getting those skills up where yeah. you can do the job yeah. in the right amount of time. I'm a reserve cop, and uh, uh, the standard nationwide is 40 hours of firearms training. Half that time was classroom time, so we had 20 hours on the range. Half the time, they had the firing order shooting, right? Mm -hmm. Half the guys right. were shooting half-loading right. ammo. The truth is, we had a total of 10 hours on the range, putting bullets down range, right. to be qualified to walk out the door and be a cop, and that's the national standard. Now, you know, it, I, I tell them, don't, don't say, you know, <sighs> I got 10 hours on the right. range with yeah. the gun in my hand. You cannot possibly match my skill. Right. Wah, wah, wah. No, <laughs> come on, don't right. go there. Don't go there. You look like right. an idiot. So that, 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 uh, that, that training that you're going to get is, is, is in many ways better than the baseline training that most of the cops will get in the academy. And, uh, and then well, we hope those cops are striving for better skills, but right. sadly they're not. You know, I, I, I talk about two case studies. We've got, uh, we got the, the, the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, oh, yeah. Florida, 49 right. dead. Yep. A cop stood outside and didn't go in. Right. He said, I heard a rifle, I had a pistol, I thought it was no match for him. Right. The, the, the lack of confidence to, to, to 49 dead people because I did, you and I <laughs> would seek that opportunity. Right. We yes. live for that day. Right. But you got cops out there. And then, of course, we got the tragic case of, uh, of the Parkland Massacre. Right. Yep. And the cop who cowered outside while children were dying. They don't, don't think all cops are, are, are at some outrageous performance level. They're not. And we need to push that standard. Th those are both training failures. That's a failure of leadership and a failure of training to create confidence in your skills and confidence to go in. The alternative that we talk about is Greg Stevens mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, outside of Dallas, Texas. Right. Uh, two would-be mass murderers, uh, ISIS-directed attack, and they rolled out of the vehicle. They had rifles, they had body armor, they had the element of surprise. And a 59-year-old traffic cop with a pistol killed them both. Right. And, 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 and Greg Stevens had trained for a lifetime. He went because to training. He did training in his own time. Because he didn't have what you talk about in your seminars, denial. Amen. Amen. He didn't sit there yeah. and pause for that few seconds, what should I do? Oh. He just took the fight directly to them. Sometimes the greatest love is not to sacrifice your life, but to live a life of sacrifice. To take your own time and to take your own money for a lifetime. Right. To train. Right. It's a sacrifice of money and time for that one day that could stop that horrible act. I am my family's secret service. There you and go. The, the great thing about America is every, you know, in, in every nation on the planet, if you're wealthy, if you're a politician, you have armed security. But the peons and peasants will never have armed security. In America, there are no elite class. The president has no more right to his armed security than I do. If I can pay for it and if I can seek that training, I, and I want to live in a nation where I am my family's secret service if you choose to do so. And, and these are terribly, tragically violent times. They're bad. They're going to get worse. And if we love our family, if we love our way of life, we'll arm ourselves and we'll train ourselves and prepare for a moment of truth. Let's talk about the stress inoculation. It's one yeah. thing to carry a gun. It's another thing to be ready to use it and not have that moment of hesitation. Yeah. So what as civilians, these teachers, these sheepdogs in the churches, what can they be doing to... Right. Let's lay a baseline on that. Now, I, I grew up in the martial arts. I love the martial arts. I love the dojo, the structure, the discipline. 20 million Americans in the martial arts. It just touches our soul. And a, um, a world class, he was, uh, he was a, uh, a French site instructor, one of only about 30 grandmaster pistol shots on the planet. Uh, Jeff Hall, mm -hmm. the most decorated oh, yeah. Alaska State Trooper, and uh, uh, a Vietnam Ranger right at the very end of the war, and a high-level martial artist. And he resurrected the martial art of the firearm. And it's uh, hujutsu. And uh, I, I worked for years and got my black belt in hujutsu. Everything's from the holster, everything's for speed, everything's under stress. You're shooting for your black belt, and you're shooting a lot. And it's three qualifications in a row. Mm -hmm. If you take one bullet that misses the, the silhouette, it's a, Done. you're disqualified. Right. 
And so there's a lot of stress to that. You're firing from the holster, you're firing against time. You know, I, I knew what shots I was missing. I, I've got a range in my basement, nothing fancy. I'm, I'm all home one or two nights a week. But I trained hard to make those shots I was right. missing. And Hujitsu has got uh, 23 practitioners have been in real world gunfights with a 98% hit rate. Wow. So there's stress just from the holster for time, striving for your belt, striving for that rank. Every martial artist knows it. But we all know that when you want to reach that next level, force on force engagements, mm -hmm. or revolution on the battlefield. Airsoft is good, paintball is good, but the gold standard is our paintball at force on force type training. Uh, NYPD put it in place. Uh, uh, you've got a real gun in your hand, you pull the trigger, a flash and a bang. What leaves the barrel is not a chunk of lead, but plastic marking right. castle. And it hurts, it hurts bad. It's not kill or be killed, it's hurt or be hurt. Mm -hmm. Uh, NYPD, 35,000 gun donors put it in place. The following year, they fired half as many shots and got three times as many hits. Today, the state of New York says you're negligent to give anybody a firearm and not give them the force on force engagements. NYPD's academy, I've reached out to the owner to do some training out there. Uh, NYPD's academy is always 40 hours of firearms training. Now it's 80 hours. Mm. And the second 40 hour block is all the force on force scenarios. Mm -hmm. So if you keep expanding your envelope, Seek those opportunities. Right. Uh, airsoft is good, paintball is good. Get these, not kill or be killed, but it's hurt or be hurt. It's, it's usually called reality-based training. training. Yep, Because there's the reality, buzzword. reality yeah. smacks you and it right. hurts, you know? And the instructors love to do it, I yeah. can say yeah. that from experience. Yeah. And, and the firefighter has to face real birdie hour you fire and train. You know, you can't train a firefighter for a lifetime with flickering red lights and fanning some red tissue paper. We, right. we intuitively know that a firefighter's gonna face real birdie fire. And ultimately, as we master our profession, we have to face real burning alley bullets. And that's that reality-based training. That's the next level that we should strive for. Uh, getting back to the whole educators, the school yeah. marshals, we'll call them now. Yeah. Obviously, not every district is going to allow this. Yeah. So teachers have emailed in to ask you, what are your suggestions for less than lethal in the classroom? Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I trained a whole school district in Mississippi this summer. And they have issued every teacher pepper spray. Uh, what we tell people, go, to, go online, uh, uh, Sabre brand, S-A-B-R-E, Sierra right. Alpha Bravo Romeo Echo. It, it's, uh, it's the one that military uses, law enforcement uses. It's in Missouri, a great company. They're one of the one, only ones really with true quality control. Go to Amazon.com, Sabre Red Pepper Gel. It, uh, it's a straight stream. There's no cross-contamination. It dyes the bad guy's face. We'll give you a case after case where it would have made all the difference in the world. Um, it was, uh, we've got perverts who, in Killeen, Texas, uh, comes in the back door of an elementary school. I mean, they, they won't keep the doors locked. Mm -hmm. He goes in the girls' bathroom, hides in a stall, and rapes the first little girl in oh, the bathroom. Um, the exact same crime happened in Kingston, Ontario. I train a lot of cops in Canada. Uh, but there happened to be a teacher walking past the girls' bathroom. He hears the girl, or she, there's only females and children in the school. Mm -hmm. The teacher, uh, she hears the girl screaming, she walks in. Uh, here's a guy pinned down this elementary girl, uh, elementary age girl in the process of gagging and stripping her. And, and uh, she's screaming, the teacher's screaming, he gets up and walks out. To this day, they have no idea who he is. Oh boy. Now, if that teacher had had pepper spray, that, it could have been a different story. You know, and Neva Rogers, Red Lake, Minnesota, nine dead. The all-time record juvenile mass murder in American history. Uh, she blocked the door with her body. Uh, if she'd have been able to give him a shot of pepper spray in the face, it could have been a different story. Mm -hmm. uh, bus drivers. I pray that I'm wrong, but we're going to see a bus massacre. Bus drivers have got to have something. That when, when that guy tries to storm on that bus, give him a shot of pepper spray, right. hit the go button, and, and get out of there. So you know, why would I tell people right now, well, 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 they don't allow us to have pepper spray. It's never enforced. <laughs> right. It's never enforced. Oh, you got pepper spray in your purse. You're out of here. That's never happened. Never once. At the moment of truth, you reach in your purse, you reach in your pocket, you pull out pepper spray, give me a shot in the face. Nobody's asked where it came from. Right. Oh, I forgot it. I had some in my purse and I remember. You know, nobody's going to ask. I know one thing. If I can't carry my firearm, I have my pepper spray. Yeah, absolutely. And if that doesn't work, then we'll go to the blade. But yes. you got to have yes. some, something and, there. And, 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 and pepper spray is, is quite effective. But there are people that'll fight through it. Right. Cops look like it's the acid test. If I give them pepper spray and they're still fighting, right. then it's on, baby. Yeah. And like you said, and you roll into the knife. You know, right. when we talk about a folder, we have a uh, partner, Ernie Emerson, a yep. big fan of Emerson knives.
But um, this, the first Emerson, the Emerson Sheepdog, has got the flipper. Mm -hmm. Now, whatever folder you have has got to have a guard. Right. A Bowie knife, a samurai sword, a K-bar, they all have a 90 degree guard. Don't think you're gonna fight with your folder. Right. You'll go right down on the blade, yep. and you'll do yourself more harm than the bad guy. So whatever the folder is that you use, and, and this is a fine motor skill breaks down under stress. The flipper's a gross motor skill. You got the guard. Uh, choose your knife carefully and have a folder tucked away out of sight. I That's just, your second line of defense. I just did two days of edge weapons, and I can't tell you the number of times guys are trying to deploy folders are falling on the floor, and then they're going for them on the floor, and then you take the guy down because... <laughs> Yeah. You got so, like throwing your wallet on the floor. You right. know, uh, so uh, yeah. choosing the right knife is an important Amen. decision, definitely. Amen. Yeah. All right, here's a question for you. I've got an 11-year-old boy I do some mentoring with, yeah. and uh, he, he had no idea of our affiliation. He had just watched uh, American Sniper. Yeah. And he was so motivated by that, he wanted to tell the Chris Kyle story at his school. So he dressed up as Chris Kyle when he did his speech, and then he said, do you know about sheepdogs? And I said, do I know about sheepdogs? Uh, I know uh, the guy uh, that uh, came up uh, with the whole uh, concept. But he looked at me at dinner and said, do you think I can be a sheepdog? So give me your take. Right. Is, that, is that a born skill? Is that something yeah. we can train to do yeah. these young people? I have my opinion, but yeah. I want to hear yours. Well, you know, our, our first sheepdog kids book, and we're really getting good sales on Amazon. Go to Amazon, look at the game Sheepdogs, Meet America's Heroes. Uh, by, by Dave Grossman and, and, uh, and my co-author, and who's an educator. Uh, 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 Stephanie Rogish, and we explained in the first book about sheepdogs. You know, there's sheep, and then there's wolves, right. then there's a brave sheepdog. And and when when they're young, they protect others, uh, and it, it's a special day when they realize they're a sheepdog. You know, they have the capacity to confront others, but they would never hurt anybody. Right. And they think they're a wolf, and then they realize they're they're sheepdogs, like the ugly duckling. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we wrap up the book by saying you know, that the sheep will die to protect the ones they love. Only the sheepdog loves enough to die for other people's loved ones. But sometimes the greatest love is not to sacrifice your life, but to live a life of sacrifice. And the kids get that. But we wrap up the sheepdog kids book by saying, in nature, a sheep is born a sheep, a, a wolf is born a wolf, and, and he's not really bad, he's part of nature. Mm -hmm. But humans are different. People give you whatever they want to be. Have you got what it takes to be a sheepdog? And uh, and I, I, I think that everybody could be a sheepdog. We, we are a nation of sheepdogs. It was carved into the DNA of our people with the Second Amendment. We were born in a bloody revolution. We, we had to turn around and fight for our freedom again in 1812. We, we, we are the people of the gun. The first pilgrims stepped off the ship with a musket in their hand. Uh, we, we, the world comes to us for gunfighting. You know, the Japanese talk about their samurai and their karate masters. The, the, the Europeans talk about their knights of the round table. But we talk about Wyatt Earp and Annie Oakley and Sergeant York. <laughs> right. And at the back of the book, well, uh, at the back of the book, we've got the original sheepdog essay. But the second sheepdog book is much more focused on civilians. And it's why mommy carries a gun. Oh, right. And and it's just dynamite stuff about if anybody in the family is going to carry a gun, mom or dad, grandma or grandpa, this is what we want the kids to know. You find a gun, stop, don't touch, get an adult. Yep. Uh, and, and at the back, we've got famous sheepdogs in American history. And some will blow your doors off. You know, we've got the Minutemen and Davy Crockett. And, and, and then we got, uh, we got Harriet Tubman, the famous Underground Railroad right. engineer. Uh, she, she called Moses because she led so many people to freedom from the slave states into the free states. Now, the wanted poster says, looks harmless but carries a pistol. Mm -hmm. And she always had a pistol. And then during the war, she became an armed scout. Uh, the, the one uh, woodcut that we have of her, she's standing there with a, with a Civil War musket in her hand. <laughs> she was never without a gun. She was an armed scout. She led an armed raid to free a bunch of, uh, of slaves in a, in a particular event. The, only, the first female to lead an armed American unit in, in, in combat ever, oh, wow. Harriet Tubman. And then, uh, you know, we talk about Annie Oakley and her story. We've got, you know, we've got uh, uh, Sergeant York, and and, uh, and then we talk about uh, Audie Murphy, oh, yeah. and then Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt carried a gun for a lifetime. She was the president's wife during World War II. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the president, the longest reigning president in American history. She was there throughout that time. She insisted on driving herself and taking herself. 
She said the Secret Service begged her to take the gun. They trained her. She carried a gun, a .22 revolver for a lifetime. When uh, FDR died, uh, she went to New York, her original home, and she got a pistol permit. And she said, I carry a gun religiously. She wow. said, I, I've got a gun, and I, I know how to use it. She was a 70-year-old grandmother in the, in the 1950s, traveling around the South, speaking for civil rights, carrying a gun with her in the face of death threats. And the one civil right that she cherished and exercised throughout her life is the right to keep and bear arms. Then we wrap up the book with Chris Kyle, right. you know, the ultimate sheepdog. Yeah. And, uh, and then we say, who's your hero? Who's a sheepdog in your life? We have a blank page to fill in. Nice. And so uh, our two sheepdog kids books. I, I, I'm, we're going to gift your young sheepdog a copy of both That would books. be great. We'll get a copy of both from me to him. Wow. Uh, he'll Thank read you. that first one. And then, you know, I, I read it to my nine-year-old granddaughter. The next night, she wanted to read it to me. Good. Uh, and then uh, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my grandson was 11 at the time. He read it. He read the original Sheepdog es essay, which is extract of on, on Combat, and then he turned around and, and read On Combat. <laughs> and the, you know, there's things that On Killing I wouldn't want a kid right, to read until right. he's high yep. school senior. Yep. And nothing in Combat I wouldn't want a kid to read as soon as he's old enough. So those Sheepdog Kids book can really motivate children to, uh, to strive for that Amen. standard. And with all our heart and soul, we, we, we commend them to your attention. All you listeners out there, get your little Sheepdogs equipped with the, uh, with the tools to... Uh, to get them that sheepdog spirit. And those those books are on Amazon, and we recommend them very highly. Two things to wrap up. Yes. We're in Des Moines, Iowa. We're about 30 miles from Ames, where we have Iowa State University that has a center for studying violence. And I know you're familiar with Dr. Craig Anderson up there. He has been trying to get the same information out that you have. And, and I post about this on my social media pages, and people say the same thing. John, I played these same games, yeah. and I haven't killed anybody. Yeah. You know what, what? What are the missing links that these yeah. people are overlooking? When I was a kid, I, I never buckled my seatbelt. Every kid never buckled a seatbelt. They're all just fine. Right. We all you lived. Know, yeah. <laughs> but you know, not every kid with his belt unbuckled died. Right. All the ones that died had their seatbelt unbuckled. Buckle. Right. Not every kid that played these games become killers. But all the killers have that one thing in common. The data is irrefutable. The FBI study had 19 school killers. Uh, and Dr. Jim McGee, no, they weren't all on Ritalin. Not on Ritalin. No, they weren't all on antidepressants. Two, maybe three. The FBI themselves could not find out in one case. People say, oh, yo, I can verify they're all in. How do you know that? The FBI couldn't find out. But of the 19, two, maybe three were prescribed antidepressants. And one of them said in his journal, one of the Columbine killers, I'm a stop drug to build my rage. Mm -hmm. The one thing that killers all had in common, the, the European study of all their killers, and the worst have been in Europe. Understand this is worldwide. Right. Finland's had three juvenile mass put in the school. The two worst uh, have been in Germany uh, with some of the rigidest gun laws in, in mm -hmm. one of the most rigid gun laws in Europe. But all of the studies say the one thing they have in common, they dropped out of life, they immersed themselves in the, the most horrific violent video games, the mass murder in Norway. The media won't tell you about these mass murders in the school in Germany. You gotta look right. it up yourself. But th that evil guy at the Mandalay Bay massacre in. Las Vegas murdered 58 people. The media doesn't tell you. In an island in Norway, a guy came on that island and murdered right. 69. The most horrendous solo gun master in Norway, and he trained on video games for a year. He says he trained for a year on video games to empower his killing to make it an automatic response. Right. Yep. So, but here's the deal on it. You know, uh, everybody, all of your listeners at one time or another, even you ladies, we all played toy guns. Said, bang, bang, I got you. Right. They said, no, you didn't. He smacks with your cap gun, it leaves him right, right. and he cries. Everybody gather around the hurt kid, yep. tries Everybody to tell him, stops. Don't, 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 don't tell mom, please right. don't tell mom, yep. I'm sorry, don't tell mom. Somebody gets hurt and the play stops. In a basketball game, and a football game, when a player gets hurt, the fans go silent and the play stops. In healthy play, whenever somebody gets hurt, the play stops. But in the video game, you blow your playmates' heads off in explosions of blood. Does the play stop? You get in trouble, you get points. You're rewarded for inflicting death and suffering. This is pathological play. This is dysfunctional play. And what it does is it creating bullies. The bullying in our schools is far worse. Oh, I was bullied when I was a kid. It can't be worse than that. It's worse. Are the mass murders in this school worse than we were kids? Believe me, the bullying is worse. Mm -hmm. And do you remember, do you remember when you were a kid? You remember that bully? 
who sincerely took pleasure in making you suffer. Well, we all have one or two. Yep. There's many, many more of those kids out there. They have been taught to take pleasure from human death and suffering. Most of, them, most of our kids just live their lives in fear, but a good chunk of them have become bullies, and a slice of them have committed violent assaults, and a slice of them have committed these mass murders. But there is nothing good for us as children of those video games. We must enforce the rating system. Uh, the industry fought all the red Supreme Court. Right. They lied, they manipulated, they misrepresented, they spent vast amounts of money to say you cannot regulate the sale of the video game to any child at any age. I understand you actually got to speak briefly with President Trump about some of this. I was at the President's conference uh, just Thursday before last in the White House. We had Senator Rubio, we had two great congresswomen, one from Utah, one from Missouri. Uh, we had Brent Bozell, who's an activist in this field, a, a, a lady representing mothers, and then we had six members of the video game industry. And they start lying from the get-go. They said there is no scientific evidence. And I said, you know, it's funny you mention that, because just in the last year, the American Psychological Association statement that right. video games raise heart rate, they raise blood pressure, Aggression. they create violent uh, uh, ideation and violent, uh, violent thoughts, they create violent activity as, as, as reported by the individuals and others, and they're cause of grave concern for our society. Yet, and this is just in the last year, study after study after study, but I just kept, now they said, well, we have a, we have a voluntary system and, and we have high compliance. No, you don't. Are you out there doing sting? And what about the online sales? Well, well we, we demand a credit card. Credit card is no evidence of age, you know that. You're, you're standing here lying to the president. The president is a very gracious, impressive guy in person. Very, very impressive guy. He reminds me of the old, the old style colonel. You know, you, you, we used to have military officers that I was in awe of. You know, they, they, they had respect for everybody. They had a plan to punch your lights out if they needed it. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't disrespect them. They'd get up and clean your clock right now. Right. Uh, if you want to fight, this guy's ready to fight. But he, he, he's very, very impressive and, uh, and, and very gracious in person. He was in completely in negotiation mode. I had no idea what he's looking at, where he plans to go with this. But I thought, I would not want to make this guy mad. I, I would good. find some nugget of concession right. that I could right. throw. Right. I would find some kernel of concession that I could throw out there. At least say, well, you know, we'll put together a panel and we'll study it and we'll get back with you. They just said, no, we're not going to do anything. You can't make us do anything. Now, they said it very politely. But, uh, oh. That's where we're at today. A sick, evil industry. Evil is defined by harming children. Every other, you know, they wouldn't buckle their baby in their car state if it wasn't the law. Every other area, tobacco, firearms, automobiles, sex, drugs, uh, there, there's many different areas where we regulate children's access. Mm -hmm. I'm a hardcore libertarian, laid back, leave me alone, I'll leave right. you alone guy. Right. But w when it comes to laws saying you can't have sex with my grandkids, I'm good with that. Right. When it comes to laws saying buck your baby in the car seat and, and you can't sell alcohol or fire on my grandkid, I'm good with that. Well, let's uh, roll this back industry's to the... fought to overcome that kind of law. So, the, the video games... The other thing we see, and I have teachers email me on Facebook, kids are coming to school with three or four hours of sleep. And that, that gets into the bullying, it gets into the all night on the video games. You know, I'm a pilot, and if I haven't had a full night's sleep, I can't fly. But yet these kids are going to school and making decisions. So what's your, your thought oh, on that? An epidemic across our entire civilization is sleep deprivation. Hey, you got to understand, these games are designed to be as addictive as humanly possible. I mean, the, the games are, they have massive online games. They know if this happens, they'll stop the game. If this happens, they'll keep playing the game. I mean, they've got hundreds of thousands of people with the automatic feedback loop. Mm -hmm. They know what causes people to continue the game just one more turn, just one more turn. They know what, okay, that's, that's a good place to quit the game. And they know how to not do that. These are the most amazingly addictive and, and seductive things. And you go into an alpha state when you play video games. Suddenly it's three o'clock in the morning. Right. Got no idea where the last six hours went. And your spouse is sincerely ticked off. Right. Uh, video games, one study tells us video games are responsible for 15% of all divorces in America. But the major impact of the video games and the social media and the cell phones are horrendously sleep deprived children. Now across the planet, that we have an explosion of teen suicides. In our military, we study every suicide intensely. And in the military, we know a sleep 
deprived a person can be up to five times more likely to take their life. We always knew that alcohol was a factor mm -hmm. in, uh, in suicide. Alcohol creates impaired judgment, make a bad decision, never get a chance to rethink it. Right. But the most pervasive form of impaired judgment is sleep deprivation. After 18 hours without sleep, your impaired judgment equaled 0.08 legally drunk. Right. After 24 hours without sleep, you're 0 0.10 legally drunk for impaired judgment. Yep. After two nights without sleep, you are psychotic. Any graduate of Army Ranger School will talk about hallucinations <laughs> right. on right. the third day without right. sleep. So what we've got is we've got these horrendously sleep-deprived children. And, and it's a key factor in suicides, drug overdoses, and traffic accidents. Suicides up across our whole society. A, a cop told me. He said, I had a good girl. He said she was an A student. She said, Dad, it's embarrassing. You don't have to take my phone every night. You can trust me. Take the phones. Yeah. So I trusted her. Right. A little while later, he said, he said a little while later, she took her life. Yep. And he said, we never knew the hell my little girl was living in until we looked at the text messages on her phone. Right. Night after night of ceaseless, relentless, vicious bullying. And she's up all night long trying to protect herself, trying to fight back. My little girl was sleep deprived and bullied to death. And he said, he said, I let it happen. He said, I can't ignore that text message in the middle of the night. Right. How do we expect our kids to? Please, when, when your kid goes to bed at night, no cell phone in the room, no laptop in the room, they've got to go to the room and sleep. Yep. Uh, uh, traffic fatalities. Uh, uh, for decade after decade, the no population's up, number of people killed in traffic accidents are down. Seat belts, airbags, and now traffic fatalities back up. A major killer of our kids, and sleep, why are truck drivers and pilots required right. to get sleep? Right, exactly. It's, it's sleep deprived kids are far more likely to have, have, have a traffic accident and, and to be killed. And then finally drug overdoses. Drugs are not new. Some of the new drugs are scary, but there's always been scary drugs. The, the new thing is sleep deprived people making life and death decisions about, about putting drug doses in their body. Mm -hmm. So the three major killers of our kids, depending on who you talk to, they, they jumble as to which one's first, second, and third, but the three major killers of our kids, suicide, traffic accidents, and drug overdoses, and sleep deprivation, impaired judgment, is a key factor in all three. As we love our kids, as we love our way of life, we have got to make them get a good night's sleep. Sleep is a biological blind spot. Our bodies don't know how to make us get enough sleep. It's a discipline right. that we have to learn at a young age. The body's not gonna naturally do it. Uh, throughout the history of our species, it got dark, and we knew it was time to go to sleep, right. and there's nothing else to do. Yeah. And then Tommy Edison, the light bulb, and the television, and the video game. And, and suddenly we've got exciting, addictive things to do all night long, and our bodies don't know how to make us get enough sleep. And so this is an epidemic across our entire civilization of chronic sleep deprivation and, and impaired judgment that interacts with every other aspect of our life. Well, after reading your books, I either use the mask or total blackout room. Yes. Even put a towel under the door to yes. block the light from yes. sleep. It does make a difference. But you sleep in a truly dark room. There's a couple things right. we can do. Uh, I teach all of our spec ops. I teach all of our feds. I teach cops in all 50 states. Last week, uh, Monday was diplomatic security service in Washington, D.C. Tuesday was border patrol in Texas. Wednesday was DEA in San Francisco. Thursday was a travel day. Friday was California Highway Patrol in San Diego. I, I train all of our tier one spec ops and, and we train sleep hygiene. Number one, you've got to sleep in a truly dark room. I'm a huge science geek. Right. My favorite website, you and I are geeks, we're science oh, yeah. geeks. My favorite website is sciencedaily.com. Oh yeah. And, uh, and the sleep lab, totally dark room, bathroom light is on, the door is shut. The light coming under the crack of the bathroom door. Is enough I light. don't even like the blue light coming from the TV. I've got a tape over it now. Good. How are you thinking? <laughs> we're, we're made to sleep in a truly dark room right. or wear the sleep mask. You will get, you may not get one more minute of sleep. You get quality sleep. You sleep in a dark room or sleep with the sleep mask. And then one other thing, the snooze alarm. Uh, the, the, the snooze alarm is pure evil. The snooze alarm is an evil little button that makes you relive the worst part of every day over, over and over. <laughs> and, and, and what we know is this. Uh, a 10 minute snooze is just enough to, to when it goes off again, to get startle response. Right, right. But that 10 minute snooze is no by as far as sleep goes. It's no by as far as your life goes. You get a snooze, another snooze, a third snooze, you just threw away 30 minutes of the day. 
they're no value as far as sleep goes, they're no value as far as your life goes. You threw away 30 minutes of the day to trick your body and go without sleep. So never, and the snooze alarm, what happens is your body tries to adapt to 10 minute naps. Your body will tie itself in knots, trying to learn to, to adapt it, and it can't do it. Mm -hmm. You're turning your body in knots, trying to adapt to 10 minute naps. But most of all, it's a discipline factor. Uh, Muhammad Ali, great act, uh, the great athlete, in the 15th round, Muhammad Ali was still sucking it up, and he said it, it began every morning with the alarm went off. Wow. And it would, he, he hated running, he hated working out so much, he put his running shoes on top of the alarm. Huh. When he reached over to hit the right. snooze alarm, he there grabbed his running shoes. It, it, we're, we're warriors, we're, we're sheepdogs. It's the first act of every day to give in to your body. It's the first act of every day to surrender. Are, are we training ourselves from a younger stage to surrender? Or I would tear my body. I'm in control of my body. I roll out of that bed and I go seize the day. There you go. The, the snooze alarm is pure evil. You, you don't touch that snooze alarm. Sleep in a truly dark room. And just those two things. That's much, much more. But just those two things can rock your world. And children, children are bathed in, in, in melatonin. They, they can sleep anywhere. As we get older, our bodies produce less and less right. melatonin. Teach your kids to sleep in the dark at a young age. Teach them to be comfortable in the dark. So this adults are comfortable in the dark. At a young age, they can handle it, but as they get older, their body stops producing that melatonin mm -hmm. and that they sleep with that light on and they're not getting the quality sleep. Raise them good at young ages. So here's your teenagers who are sleeping in, in bright light and they're getting minimal sleep anyway. They're getting bad quality sleep and they're sleeping in a, in a brightly lit room, you know, with the, maybe that TV's on. Right, and that, right. that, that, so there's things we can do to rock our world and, and to raise sheepdogs who will, who will continue what our nation's all about. Uh, I am a sheepdog under the authority of the great shepherd. He that is living in me is far greater than he that lives in the world. I wanted to wrap up with that. We've talked mental fitness, physical fitness. You're a big proponent of spiritual fitness because we don't know when our day's going to be. Amen. You know, uh, I, I, I teach all of our military and bases nationwide. And how do you think the military justifies chaplains in this day and age? Mm -hmm. Resiliency, people who do not get PTSD. Uh, the, the scientific research over and over again, faith is a vital component in resiliency. And, and we, we've got to maintain that faith. And if you're a sheepdog and you don't know the great shepherd, it's hard to be a sheepdog right. without the great shepherd. Exactly. And you know, sheepdogs have to walk out that door every day and lay their life down. First responders, military, if the day comes that nobody's willing to lay their life down, put their life on the line, fold up the flag and kiss our nation goodbye. But the great shepherd gave his life once and forever for us to have spiritual life. You know, and don't curse God when bad things happen. We're all going to die. and We've seen a lot of deaths and they're all bad. Uh, don't curse God when bad things happen. Recognize that he, he didn't promise bad things wouldn't happen to our church and bad things wouldn't happen to us, but he promised if we turn to him that, that, that he paid the price to give us salvation. But you know, I, I wrap up my sheepdog class by saying, you know, he that is in me is far greater than he that is living in the world. I am a sheepdog under the authority of the great shepherd, endowed by my creator with inalienable rights, yep. empowered by my constitution to keep them in their arms, arms, inspired by, by my forefathers to fight for this land I love. love. I am a sheepdog under the authority of the great shepherd. And, and this, this is as far as the minions, minions of hell are going. going. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, John. Amen. Thank you, Praise brother. Praise God. Praise God.